Good afternoon, and we're glad that you're able to join us. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Psalms 85, the 85th book of Psalms. Psalms 85. And we're going to begin reading right there at that first verse. It says, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sins, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation and cause thine anger to cease or towards us to cease. Will thou be angry with us forever? Will thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Will thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what the God, what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the ways of his steps. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Even though the entire book Psalms 85 is a blessing in itself. We want to bring your attention to verses 4 through 7. Turn us, O God, of our salvation and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Will thou be angry with us forever? Will thou draw out or prolong thine anger to all generations? Will thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Here, the writer was asking our Heavenly Father to turn his people around, to revive his people, to bring them back to spiritual life, to restore their love and joy for a holy God who so loved them that he delivered them and brought them out of their captivity in Babylon. We also today are at a place of spiritual weakness where we too can cry, Lord, Wilt thou not revive us again, that we may rejoice in thee? Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger towards us to cease. We can say this. Saints, there is a mighty move of God's spirit in the earth. Revival is moving so fast that lives are turned upside down. Jesus Christ is on his way, and the ability to be clothed in his righteousness is always before him. We say lives are being turned upside down because the cry is for his people, his chosen to get right with God and prepare to go home. Notice that his hand is in everything that has to do with us. And he's stripping and exposing sin and causing everything that we love not to love us. And everything that we want, not to want us. But listen, don't resist him. There are many souls that need to be revived, to become active again in the things of God, and to flourish again with a passion for his holy word. Many souls out there need to be restored to a consciousness of his holy presence and pray for the life of his word to live again in them. Now, we all know that people have their own reasons for coming into the church. And we also know that many of them are not serving God today. The problem is no one felt the weight of sin because there was no real conviction of one's own sin. Why? Because many people come to the altar feeling justified to blame someone else. Forgiveness comes when we can see the damage from our own sin, see our own selves in error and in need of saving. 
But look, because of anger, hatred, and unforgiveness, godless sorrow and genuine repentance didn't have a chance. So many were unable to see how lost they were or how great God is. In the scriptures, due to their present distress, the captives of Judah are taught to pray to God for his grace and mercy. They also are to acknowledge and give thanks for the great things that he has done for them. In verse four, they pray for converting grace and for him to uh, have a change of heart, not to be angry. Turn us, O God, of our salvation and cause thy anger towards us to cease. They knew that they needed God to turn them because all they ever did was sin against him. We too must realize that only God, our heavenly father, can do this. He can't revive and manifest his glory through us until we allow him to help us get rid of everything that separates us from his presence. God wants us to live to come alive and be free. There are souls everywhere desiring to be told the truth. They want to. They want to live holy. They want their sins confronted. And if they would humble themselves and trust him to restore his presence in them with power, his goodness would lead them to repent and a wonderful change would occur. King David understood this. When he wrote in Isaiah 57 and 15, for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabited eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. It's saying that God inhabits sincerity and will work in those who are sincere by the word and spirit of his grace. If there's no sincerity, there's no conversion. This is why so many are turning away from seeking the righteousness of God and the reason why sin is so out of control in the church. Too many people were accepted into the fellowship and put into position without first being convert, uh, convicted of their sins and experiencing a genuine repentance. A true change in their behavior. We talked about this last week. They came in as they were. And even when they refused to change, we just put up with them and the spirit that controls them. But the message to the people of God is repent. Preachers, you must return to and preach the only gospel that truly confronts sin, not compromise with it. And you have to do this no matter if they like you or not, no matter if they stay at your church or leave. This is something that you're mandated to do. Revival is sure to come, but it must be introduced by a return to the basic truth of the gospel, the preaching of the cross and the sufferings of Christ and a return to teaching about the blood of the Lamb and the work of the Holy Spirit. Churches today are packed out every week, and many souls have stood before the altar. But listen, how many were truly convicted of their sins and converted? How many can you truly look at as a tree planted by God and say, I know them by their fruit? O oh Lord, wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? It truly takes God to undo what sin has done, even in our minds. If people do not understand the depth of their sin, the seriousness of the pain and suffering it causes, there cannot be a genuine repentance, a change in their behavior or heart. If someone who sells drugs come to the altar but has no remorse and is not concerned that a life was ruined, that families were destroyed, or that children were being sold and raped for their drugs, 
They don't understand the depth of their sin, the seriousness of the pain and suffering that it caused. If a man or a woman has no control over their sexual appetite and goes from partner to partner, yet comes to the altar but has no remorse or concern that their body is the temple of God or that their reputation is ruined, that their sons or daughters are watching the parade of lovers and learning, or that one of them was even raped or molested, or for a woman pregnant, not knowing the father of the child, an abortion can become the choice of the day. Or the fact that there is a man with children all over the city that don't even know who he is. They don't understand the depth of their sin. If a married man or woman come to the altar but is not concerned that their selfish acts to commit adultery, fuss, fight, and argue has destroyed a family or a church, even separated friends, they don't understand the depth of their sin, the seriousness of the pain and suffering it causes. Or if a person steals from you or manipulates and deceives those that are around them and come to the altar with no remorse and is not concerned about ever being trusted, telling the truth or going through things uh, about things the right way, they don't understand the depth of their sin. No matter what the sin may be, if you can easily repent or always say you're sorry for anything so fast without seriously considering what changes need to take place in your life, you do not truly understand the depth of your sin. This is why there are not many strong relationships with God. People know that if they sought to know him and his ways, he would reveal himself to them. But the truth is, many are so deep in sin, they don't want to know him, nor do they want to change. They're happy just pretending. Oh, but God is not mocked. He wants true, genuine repentance, a change in our behavior that will stop the sin and lust from controlling us. It's time to realize that there is no lasting comfort in sin and that sin separates us from his holy presence. Understand that when we are separated from God, there is no fellowship with him, no power and no life. If we truly want to want God to revive us again, causing us to return to him in prayer, seeking first his kingdom and re- and be restored to a consciousness of his holy presence, we must come to him willing to be changed. God is preparing his people, those souls who want to serve him, love and obey him, who will practice daily submission to God in order to acknowledge and resist every temptation and walk in total victory in the presence of a holy God. There must be a death to self and selfish pleasures. We can't continue to make excuses. Why? Because we have power with God. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We are kept only by his grace. So the scripture says, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. The cry was for God to turn us. And by his grace, Don't be angry anymore. To revive us again and restore the joy of our salvation. But the truth of the matter is, only true repentance will bring restoration and revival. I want you to turn with me to Hosea, the 14th chapter. Hosea 14 and verses 1 through 9. These verses tell of Hosea's call for Israel to repent. It tells of God's promises of restoration and also of God's concern for justice. And it reads, 
O Israel, return unto the Lord your God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will we render the calves or offerings of our lips. Asherah shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses. Neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, you are our God. For in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely. For my anger is turned away from him. I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree and his smell as Lebanon. They that dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the the wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? I have heard him and observed him. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. Who is wise and he shall understand these things? Prudent and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right and the just shall walk in them. But the transgressors shall fall therein. These scriptures show Israel God's chosen people being called to return to him. Their idols were their stumbling blocks. This is what got them in trouble, looking to everything but him. Yet those who had fallen by sin could get up again by simply repenting. How? By turning to the Lord inwardly in their heart and outwardly in their lives, allowing a change to come. We too should repent for seeking help from everyone and everything when we get in trouble and not God, who according to the scriptures is our very present help. The truth of the matter is there's no difference between us, God's elect now, and Israel, God's elect then. We're all in the same situation. All have sinned according to his word and come short of his glory. We all have looked elsewhere other than to God for our help, for our healing, for our deliverance. We all have worshipped or admired something other than God. So we all have been found guilty. We also have to count everything as a loss, our talent, our education, skills, and ability. Then repent for saying to the work of our hands, you are our God, or we have prospered by our own ability. When you look into the scriptures, this is the same thing that they were doing. They were looking to other armies or nations that were greater than them and looking to them for help, looking to them to deliver them. And even in the things that they possessed, they were actually thinking to themselves that this was of their own doing. But we all know that according to the word that God is a jealous God. And he will share his glory. Listen to me. God will share his glory with no man. And so this is why it was such an abomination to him. Because of the fact he knew that it was only because of him. Further on, God promises that when there is a return to him, his anger will cease. He's willing to forgive and heal. With his due, spiritual growth shall come forth as a lily very fast. Because in Christ, drawn from his strength and depending on him, according to his word, our roots will go deep as the cedar tree in Lebanon, where no trial, trouble, or test can pluck us up. We are settled in God, established in God. The root of his word is in us. His spirit is in us. And no matter what the test, as I said, the trial or the trouble that will come, We are able to what? Endure. Why? Because the Lord is with us. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Why? Because the Lord God is with me. Do I get discouraged? Yes, I do. Do I get depressed sometimes? Yes, I do. 
Do I become afraid sometimes? Yes, I do. But when you stand upon the word of God, even in your fear, when you begin to draw the sword of that spirit and fight, you have the victory. Why? Because the Lord God is with you. This is all an expression of God's grace and mercy. He shall return. We shall be revived. And our scent shall be as a fine wine, bringing forth useful fruit to the honor of God and man. As for Ephraim, grace and mercy was extended when he acknowledged his error and sought after God. Allowing us also to understand that God is our bottom line. All that exists comes from him. He is the only one who can or even wants to when it comes to our survival. That's why no one can really boast. God is the bottom line. Everything that was created was created by him. Therefore, anything that is made, anything that is invented was made or invented by that which God himself already created. So where is the pride? Where is the boasting? Where is the arrogance? Where does all that come from? Where is the very thought to even think that my hands have made this, that they are my God, that my intelligence, my education? It's all vanity. He will share his glory with no man. From him we receive grace and the ability to do all that we can to please him. So the truth is, whatever we do to bring forth glory and honor to him, all of the praise and worship should be for him. He's the bottom line. Everything concerning us is from God or because of God. And we must worship him and give him all the glory and all the praise because it's him working in us both the will and to do of his good pleasure. If it was not for God's grace and his mercy, he would have left us in our sins. Because his word tells us, while he hung on Calvary's cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Crucifying the son of the living God. All that we do in our lives, all the choices and the decisions that we have made. Many of us have made a lot of mistakes. But God allows you every morning to get up. Mercy, grace, and his compassion is made new every morning. You have an opportunity every morning to choose life. To choose to do what is right. To go about and seeking the things of God. Humbling yourself, calling upon him, acknowledging him to help you. Revive us again, oh God. We need to be restored. We need God to move by his spirit and to help us. If we humble ourselves and trust him to restore his presence in us with power, a wonderful change will occur. You will become active again in the things of God. Many of you have just went somewhere and sat down. You don't fellowship nowhere. You don't read. You don't pray. You don't even acknowledge God. Even when someone is around you and they say praise God or acknowledge God for something, you don't even know what to, how to respond because you need to be restored. Just a touch. You just need one touch. And I'm telling you, God is able. You will become active again in the things of God if you let him touch you and be restored to a consciousness of his holy presence. And the life of his holy word will live again in you. The beautiful thing is the word of God is planted in us. And even if it seems as though that word is dead, God is able to cause the life of that word to live again in you. So 
is up to you. Many have become cold. Many have become hard. Many have become despondent. Many have came up with many, so many justifications and so many reasons why they don't do this, that, or the other when it comes to the things of God. But I'm telling you, when you stand before him, you will be without excuse. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. This is a gift and we didn't do anything to deserve it. So I encourage each and every one of you to look to the word that we even shared on today and cry unto the Lord and look to him and say unto him, turn us, O God, of our salvation. And cause thy anger towards us to cease. Revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. And you know what? He loves you just that much that he would do exactly what you ask. Amen. Let us pray. Most gracious and eternal God, we come in the name of Jesus. And we just acknowledge you as holy. We acknowledge you as great and greatly to be praised. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is no, no confusion. We know that you so loved us that you sent your son to die for us. And we desire you to revive us again, O oh God. Many that need to be restored, O oh God. Many that need a touch from you. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you will quicken your word within them. That you will return their hearts and their minds back to you in the name of Jesus Christ, that their joy will manifest even the more. Heavenly Father, you are God and you are so good. And we're so glad to know that in the deepest of our depths, oh God, you're able to deliver us. You're able to save us. We pray that you will bring us to a genuine repentance where we will become to know the seriousness of our sin, oh God, the depth of our sin, that we will feel the weight of our sin and come to a true, genuine repentance before you. Heavenly Father, you are God and you are so good. And we trust that you will do all that we ask you to do. For you said in your word, you're coming back for your church without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. And we want to be ready, oh God. We want to be prepared. And so we humble ourselves and ask you to have your way. Whatever it is, oh God, not our will, but thy will be done. Whichever way you would take it, oh God, however you would do it, oh God, not our will, but thy will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.